Hi, with this video I want to look at how different magmas will crystallise particular minerals in a sequence. It will help us to explain some of the ideas we've mentioned already in the course but haven't really properly explained. It's an idea crucial to the understanding of igneous rocks called Bowen's Reaction Series, named after this guy, Norman Bowen. You should be familiar with these different types of igneous rocks. The ones in bold are the ones you need to be able to recognise for your course. These igneous rocks are classified by their grain size, and crucially, by their composition, whether they're ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, or silicic. Now, these different types of igneous rocks, as you can see on this table, are characterised by different proportions of the silicate minerals that make up all igneous rocks. So you can see, for example, peridotite is predominantly olivine. When we look at granite, it contains no olivine, but there's a significant amount, for example, of quartz or of orthoclase feldspar. This diagram tries to illustrate the changing proportions of each of these minerals as we uh, look at the full range of igneous rocks really defined ultimately by their silica content. We have already looked at a, a two-dimensional graph like this. So, the question begs itself, where do these different composition uh, of igneous rocks come from? Now, one of the other aspects we need to look at is plate tectonics and how plate tectonics has an influence on melting. We've seen this already at AS, but as a reminder, we know at constructive plate margins, we see basaltic magma. At destructive plate margins, we get the uh, formation of andesitic magma. Mantle plumes, particularly suboceanic ones, produce basalt. And if we bury some concentric crust deep within the crust uh, during an orogeny, we end up with granites. Okay. But it's not the only source, or not the only control, should I say, on the magma. It's not just the original composition uh, of the melt which determines what rock we get at the end. There are a whole series of what we call magma differentiation processes. These include uh, the cooling rate has an effect, uh, the processes of crystallization, uh, and also chemical reactions that happen within the magma chamber also help determine the final composition and texture of an igneous rock. I want to look at one of these things in particular. Okay, This is, uh, as I said at the start, Bowen's reaction series, and a series of experimental uh, crystallization experiments uh, undertaken back in the 1920s to determine the range of temperatures at which particular minerals crystallize in the melt. This is backed up then with observations we can uh, make in the field, for example, at places like Skergard in Greenland, that we will talk about later in the course. Okay, there is a sequence that minerals will crystallize in. On this very simple diagram, you can see that we have uh, a range of temperatures, higher at the top, lower at the bottom. And we've got a few different arrows going on, showing us some sequences of minerals. Let's start filling some of this in. The highest temperature mineral we'll see crystallizing is olivine. Olivine will be followed in its crystallization by orgite. Following orgite, we have hornblende. And after hornblende, biotite. 
you may think you may notice that there are some similarities between these minerals that uh, I've revealed so far, principally in, to, in their colour and density. There are also similarities in the composition. Perhaps you could find those out. What are these minerals actually composed of? On the other side of the diagram, we can see we have plagioclase. But again, there's a change in the plagioclase as we go from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. Down at the bottom of the diagram, we see minerals at lower temperatures crystallizing like orthoclase, muscovite, and quartz. Again, they have something in common. Think about their color, think about their densities. And again, think about their compositions. Okay. The two parts of this diagram are called reaction series. On the left-hand side, we have the discontinuous reaction series. So called because these minerals are noticeably, recognizably different. You can identify each of these minerals in hand specimen as being very different. On the right hand side, we have what's known as the continuous reaction series. It's called continuous because at this large range of temperatures, we see just plagioclase. Now it does change, it changes from being calcium rich at higher temperatures to being sodium rich at lower temperatures. We need to find out why that is, but it does help us to explain why plagioclase is such a common mineral in all igneous rocks. If we want to put a bit more detail on this, we can look at this diagram. This is showing the same idea, but perhaps in a little bit more detail. Here we have the temperature ranges uh, of crystallization, also some variations in composition between each of these different minerals. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to name each of these minerals as shown by the bars indicating the temperatures at which they crystallize from the order of crystallization we've looked at in the previous diagram. Pause the video and give it a go. Okay, if we look at the results, these are the minerals and the temperatures at which they crystallize. Going from olivine, it's over 1300 degrees right down to quartz at below 600 degrees. So these different reaction series, for example, a continuous reaction series for plagioclase feldspar, has the same mineral, effectively. When we look at the different types of plagioclase, they look the same. That's because the mineral structure stays the same, except we get some substitution, replacement of um, elements within the crystal lattice within plagioclase that doesn't fundamentally change its physical properties. The discontinuous reaction series, which is made up of the ferromagnesian minerals, the ones that are made of iron and magnesium, as well as silica. At different temperatures, these elements will combine in different ways to create a different mineral structure. As a result, we see distinctive different minerals. Now, there are some changes within this uh, to do with the chemical reactions that happen within the magma. We're going to discuss this a little bit more in class. But ultimately, this is what we get. 
we see different minerals crystallizing at different temperatures. So the higher temperatures there, you can see from maybe uh, 1,000 degrees uh, and above, we get olivines, we get orgite, we get plagioclase feldspar. That's going to make a mafic magma. Down at the bottom of the diagram, below 800 degrees, we see some hornblende, we see biotite, we see muscovite, we see quartz, we see um, orthoclase, we see plagioclase. The typical components of a granite, of a silicic magma. You can add this detail now to your diagram. What compositions are formed at what temperatures? There are some assumptions made with this. It is experimental. There's an idea we call chemical equilibrium. So if we have enough time, enough contact between these crystals that form and the melt, we'll see changes with the elements going back into the magma uh, to be crystallized into new minerals at lower temperatures. If this all happens, the final rock is going to be the same as the original magma. Nothing's going to change. However, we can get evidence of crystallization out of equilibrium, perhaps a more real world scenario where crystals and melt get separated or there isn't time to let all the reactions uh, take place. We need to think about what the geological implications of this might be. We see several things within crystal structures, like the one you're looking at, within bigger igneous intrusions that indicate that this crystallization out of equilibrium must happen. So we can see a geological product of these processes. We can see if we look at places like Skergard in Greenland, a geological structures created by this differentiated magma, by this order of crystallization, okay, with this crystallization out of equilibrium. It also can inform us about microscopic structures within igneous rocks. And crucially, I think, it can also even inform surface processes. Why some minerals, for example, like quartz, are extremely common in sedimentary rocks, yet not that common in igneous rocks. Whereas minerals like olivine, which, which is a common mineral in, in basalt, hardly ever becomes incorporated into a sedimentary rock. Think about your interesting question, bring it along to class. I'll see you there.